Hello, Life Point friends and family. Thank you for joining us today. If you're new, welcome to the family. May God's message find its way to you no matter where you are. Enjoy the service. Please stand to join us in worship this morning. Awesome. Look what you've done. How could you fall so far? You should be ashamed of yourself So I was ashamed of myself The lies I believed They got some roots that run deep I let them take a hold of my life I let them take control of my life Standing in your presence, Lord I can feel you digging all my roots up I feel you healing all my wounds up All I can say is hallelujah Look what you've done, look what you've done in me. You spoke your truth into the lies and let my heart believe. Look at me now, look how you made me new. The enemy did everything that he could do. Oh, but look what you've done. And suddenly shame is gone I thought I was too broken now I see you are breaking new ground inside of me standing in your presence Lord I can feel you digging all my roots up I feel you healing all my wounds up all I can say is hallelujah look what you've done look what you've done in me you spoke your truth into the light Oh, but look what you 
death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hands Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand presence today and continue to remind us that you are always in, in our presence all the time and all, a lot of times we may stray away from you. God, I pray for those that are carrying, carrying this morning a lot of uh, guilt and shame. They're just walking this face of the earth with no hope and believing just in themselves and not knowing that you're there and it just remind those that, that are walking around sh shamelessly in guilt that you know, their debt has been paid on the cross, and we have everlasting life through you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, Life Point friends and family. We're so happy that you're here with us today. If this is your first time joining, we would love to connect with you, so please text hello to the number on the screen. Enjoy the service, and God bless. I want lasting relationships. How about you? Or would you like to leave a trail of bodies from here until the time you check out? I don't think so. I think you would really like to have a healthy family, lasting relationships. 
I think you'd like to get along with people at work. You'd like for people to like you, right? It just makes sense as a human being that you'd want that kind of feel about yourself. You'd want people to care about you. You'd want to be the kind of person that people would want to be around. I don't want to be the guy that everybody can't wait to leave. I'd like to be the guy that they're happy when I show up. And I think you feel the, the same way. But I can tell you that no matter how much you feel that way, want that type of thing, it's just inevitable. It's inevitable that there's going to come moments where, well, just like me, where I do something wrong and I need someone to forgive me. Now, I can tell you this. If you don't remember anything else today, remember this. There are no lasting relationships without forgiveness. None. We need forgiveness. I, I can tell you that it's just a matter of time if you, before interactions between me and you or between you and your husband or you and your wife, you and your kids, you and your neighbors, you and your co-workers, you and other people in the church, you and, well, it doesn't matter who, before there's going to come some moment where for whatever reason, you do something that really upsets somebody else and you'll need forgiveness. But it's also going to be the other way around. They're going to be, at the same time, you're going to mess up, they're going to mess up. And sometimes you'll need to extend forgiveness to them. There are no lasting relationships without forgiveness. I need it. You need it. I need to give it. And you need to give it. What if you're just kind of some kind of like super Christian, maybe, you know, maybe if you were a super Christian, that wouldn't be, it wouldn't, that wouldn't be the case. Some of you will know who Billy Graham is. He died a few years back. In the last century, he literally spoke to millions of people and led people by the hundreds of thousands to accept Christ. He was what they refer to as an evangelist, and he was an incredible evangelist. He, he did an amazing job. He traveled all over the world doing this. His wife, Ruth, a wonderful woman, was asked one time, have you ever contemplated divorcing Billy, your husband? He said, she said, no but I have contemplated murder on a number of occasions. <laughs> and that was Billy Graham. He's a far better person than I am. And dare I say you, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe you shine brighter than Billy Graham. I don't know. What about these characters in the Bible? When you look in the Bible, one of the things I love about it is it tells the truth about people. And so when you start thinking about the incredible people in the Bible, you'll start noticing that every one of them, they talk about the flaws and the, where they mess up. And you, you look at them and you, know, you, you see people like Peter and Peter seems to be like everybody's favorite person because he's like the royal screw up that ends up doing so well. And so we kind of hope that maybe, you know, that'll be us, even though we screwed up, that we'll end up doing well. But when I think about some of the most incredible people in the Bible, I think about the guy the Apostle Paul. And the guy that helped Apostle Paul get assimilated into the Christian community once he became a Christian because the Apostle Paul was killing Christians before he became one. And Barnabas is the one that helped him in terms of getting accepted by other believers. Well, at one point, these two were led by God. Just to, we're going to do something no one's ever, else, ever done. They were led to start going from country to country, city to city, telling people about Jesus, leading people to become Christians, and then starting churches. They, had, uh, a, they made the decision they're going to take a young guy by the name of Mark along. And so they go from country to country, city to city, and they're nearly killed. Sometimes they're they're badly treated. I mean, it's, it's incredibly dangerous. It was incredibly hard. And at a, a particular point, Mark just had enough of it. He, just, he abandoned them. He took off. Well, Barnabas and Paul finished what they were doing. They went, these, these trips lasted for years at a time. And then there was a, they came back to their, I guess you call it their home church. And in their home church in Antioch, you know, they rested up 
continue to teach people there. And then after a certain point, God led them to go do it again. So one of the things they did was decide, okay, let's go back to some of the places we've already been before to see if we can be helpful to them. And then we'll go to new places we've never been before. Barnabas said, let's take Mark. Paul said, no, it's, this is too hard. I don't wanna deal with that guy anymore. And so they had a conflict over it. The conflict to the point where they separated ways. Barnabas took Mark, went one direction, Paul, Silas, others went another direction. These are two of the finest Christians that ever lived and they came to the point of conflict where they couldn't continue because they both thought something should be done differently. Well, how did it turn out? Well, as it turns out later on, you can read that the Apostle Paul sent for Mark. You read about how later on he sent for Mark and said, Mark is a great help to me. So later they became close and they worked together. And guess who that Mark ended up being? The Mark that God used to write one of the biographies about Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Bible. That Mark that screwed up, that needed forgiveness, got forgiveness, and got used by God. So how big a screw up are you? You say, oh, you know, I don't think God ever used me anymore. I mean, I, you wouldn't, I, I can't tell you what I've done. At least I don't want to tell you what I've done. And so I'm, you know, I'm eliminated. Well, Apostle Paul, before he became a Christian, was killing Christians. Mark is a person who abandoned people in the middle of a missionary journey. We all, at some point, need forgiveness. And we all, at some point, need to extend forgiveness. It's hard though. Jesus modeled it. He taught it. But perhaps the most shocking moment in terms of Jesus extending forgiveness is something we read about in Luke chapter 23. In Luke 23, Jesus is being crucified. They're killing him. The Roman soldiers have already beat him to the point where he's almost dead. He was so weak he couldn't carry the cross. They had to get somebody else to carry the cross because, he, you know, they, when they beat someone, they almost beat him to death. He was bleeding. He was a bloody mess. He was so weak he could barely function. Then they were nailing him to a cross, and I don't know what it would be like to have nails shoved through like that. Incredibly painful. But what he said while they were doing that is, Father... Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I mean, what kind of, who does that? I mean, who can possibly forgive somebody in the middle of doing something like that? Well, Jesus, that's who. But Jesus calls us to do the same kind of thing. I know, I, okay, can we be honest? I think we'd rather call down God's wrath at that particular point, then extend forgiveness to someone hurting us like that. When he did this, people were there, they heard him, they saw him do this thing. It, just, it was as stunning to them as it is to you. How can he possibly do something like that? So what do the believers do? Well, the believers not only knew what Jesus said and how he brought it up many different times about being forgiving toward others, but they saw this and they were impacted by it. A short time after Jesus was resurrected, he ascended back to heaven. And then the, the early believers began to tell other people about Jesus. Some people were so upset that they were saying that a man could be God in the human form that they said, we gotta kill these people that are doing this thing. We gotta stop them because this is so crazy. And so they began to persecute Christians. And at first it was more economic and harassment, but then it became deadly. The very first Christian that was killed for being a Christian was a man by the name of Stephen. Look what Stephen did in Acts chapter seven. As they, they stoned him, as they were throwing stones on him in order to kill him. 
Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You'll notice that those of you that know the Bible, when Jesus was dying, he said, Father, receive my spirit. He heard it. He knew it. He was following in the same thing, same pattern that Jesus had shown him. Stephen fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. He did that because he saw what Jesus did. He did that because he heard how Jesus taught, how Jesus taught about forgiveness. Forgiveness was a pattern of Jesus' life. It was, it was why he came. He came in order to provide a way for us to be forgiving and to te- be forgiven and to teach us to forgive. To get to the point where you need to forgive somebody, you have to be hurt. Somebody has to do something against you that hurts you in order for you to be in a position where you need to forgive somebody else. And so that's not where we want to be, but it's inevitable it's going to happen. And the way that you react when that happens is life-changing, not only for you, but for the people around you. When you're around people that can experience that kind of pain and then turn around and offer forgiveness, it gets people's attention. Jesus was forever rocking our boats. He didn't just say, forgive your husband or your wife or your kids or your neighbors or your co-workers. He said, I want you to forgive your enemies. I don't know who your enemy is right now, but there, you have them. If you have anything that you stand for, there'll be somebody that stands against it. There'll be people that think the exact opposite of you. There are people that like to cancel you. And Jesus says, I want you to love them in such a way that people know that you're loving your enemies. But here's the thing, right? When I stop and think about that, I mean, how do you do that? I mean, how do you love an enemy like that? Because, you know, some of us, our first reaction, and this is bad, our first reaction is when somebody gets something on us, we don't want to get even, we want to get ahead. We want to punch their lights out in Jesus' name and then pray for them, right? But that's not what Jesus said we're to do. So how do you forgive Like Jesus said, Matthew 5, verse 44, this is Jesus speaking directly to you. He says, I'm telling you, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to literally love your enemies. I mean, love is just, it's not a warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is when you do what's best for another person, when you put their needs ahead of you. He says, uh, and one illustration of what that means, that means you're literally praying for your enemies. You're, who are your enemies? If you voted for Trump, is it Biden? If you voted for Biden, is it Trump? Is it, if you're an independent, is it both parties? Is it, I mean, who is your enemy? Is it Putin? Is it Xi Ping? How do you say that guy's name? Xi Jinping? Yeah, okay. Is it him? Who is it? When's the last time, I, I know the answer, when's the last time you prayed for Putin and Xi? Like never? Okay, I get it. Shoot, I, you say I haven't even prayed for my cousins, much less those guys. Pray for those who persecute you. So how can we forgive like Jesus? How can you do it? Now, Here's how you do it. You decide to forgive. You see, it's a choice. It is a choice. You choose to forgive. I don't know about you, but uh, 
Every once in a while, I'll run across people that I can tell that they make their decisions based on emotions. You know, how I feel about this or how I feel about that. But we all know that that's a, that's a recipe for trouble. If you're basing your life decisions on how you feel, you're making some bad decisions. Yeah, gosh, I just don't feel like, it's Monday, I don't, oh, God, I see. I can call in sick of work. That's it, I'll call in sick of work. Or it's Friday. Man, I need a three-day weekend. I just want, I don't feel like going. So I think I'll just call in sick because I don't, I don't feel like going. How's that gonna work for you when you're basing your life on how you feel instead of what you need to do? Well, it's not gonna work well at all. When it comes to deciding to forgive, it's like saying, Jesus asked me to do it. I'm not gonna base it on my emotions because if I base it on my emotions, the only thing I wanna do is pray that <clears throat> the person just dies. It's easier to act yourself into a new way of feeling than it is to feel yourself into a new way of acting. When I was in seminary, there was a guy by the name of Dr. John Drake, <clears throat> Drakeford. He was a, a professor there, and he made that statement in class. And <clears throat> when he made that statement in class, all of a sudden, I remember what my mother told me. I was in high school, and I, and I was having a hard moment. And so <clears throat> I, I was, it was really a tough moment. And my, my mother noticed that I wasn't smiling a great deal over a period of days. And so at one point she walked up to me and she said, Alan, smile. I said, well, mom, I, I don't feel like smiling. And what she told me at that point was, Alan, if you'll begin to smile soon, you'll feel like smiling. What she was saying is what Dr. Drakeford told me later. It's easier to act yourself into a new way of feeling than it is to feel yourself into a new way of acting. When you, you, you make decisions about what the right thing to do is, you act on the basis of your will, not on the basis of your emotions. I'm a pastor, and it's pretty easy for me to do something wrong still. Really easy. How about you? But one of the illustrations I use over and over again, and I use it over and over again because I want you to be able to finish it as soon as I start it. I want it to become so familiar with you that you know it and you use it yourself because it's something that helps people. Let's assume you only did one thing a day wrong, just one. You said something you shouldn't say, you did something you shouldn't do, or maybe you failed to do something that you should have done. Whatever it is, just one thing a day wrong. In a year's time, that's 365 things you've done wrong. Well, let's say you live 70 years. 70 times 365 is over 25,000. So at one a day, in a lifetime, you're polishing up 25,000 plus things wrong that you've done. If you were hauled before a judge and you had 25,000 violations of the law, where would you be? You'd be in a lot of trouble. We have a bigger problem with doing things wrong than we realize. But in spite of all that, actually because of all that, here's what we read in Ephesians chapter one. God is so rich in kindness and grace. Grace is unmerited favor for you. You don't, you don't deserve it, you, don't, you haven't earned it. He just loves you and gives it to you if you'll accept it. <clears throat> He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He offers this forgiveness to you if you'll accept it. And so what God wants us to do is to look at the teaching of Jesus, look at the life of Jesus, the pattern of Jesus, and to realize remember, that 25,000 violations of the law, realize that we've been forgiven a great deal because of his kindness and grace and so because we've been forgiven, he wants us to forgive others. Once again, forgiveness was the pattern of Jesus' life. It's why he came to provide it. The Bible's full of stuff. I, we could literally just talk Bible verse after Bible verse all day long about this. In Colossians chapter 3, it says this. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. 
Ah, you want to scream? Anyone except that knucklehead brother of mine, anyone except my uncle, anyone except that obnoxious neighbor I've got, anyone except my boss, anyone except whoever just came to your mind, who offends you. Because remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So how did God forgive us? Well, God forgave us after we repented, cleaned up our act, lived sinless for six years. Is that right? No, it's not right at all. He forgave us exactly the, where we were, as we were, the mess that we are, the mess that we were. That's how he forgave us. And so when you look at somebody, you think, well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. Correct? Neither did you. The very first thing you have to do is to decide not to follow your emotions, but to make a decision as an act of your will. I choose to forgive in spite of my emotions. Second thing is, forgive because you really need to be set free yourself. What you're going to find is that when you, when you forgive somebody else, the prisoner that you set free turns out to be you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Jesus is doing this famous Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, this is how you should pray. And included in that prayer was this statement, forgive us our sins, we're talking to God the Father, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Dangerous statement, dangerous prayer. God, forgive me to the extent I'll be willing to forgive others, but don't forgive me any more than that. And don't let, and don't let us yield to temptation because God, it's going to be hard to do that. My temptation is going to be to be the opposite of that. But rescue us from the evil one because the evil one's going to tell me, look, you need to just, go, you need to just cut that guy to his knees, man. You just whatever it takes, get back, get even. No, don't do that. Get ahead. But he went on to say, Jesus, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. I don't know about that statement. Do you? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the fact that God says that forgiveness is such a big deal? If you're not forgiving toward other people, I'm not going to be forgiving toward you. I don't know that I like that statement. Do you like that? I'm, let's be honest. What we want to do is have every, all of our sins forgiven and then God's wrath come down on all those people that are causing us all this trouble. The Apostle Peter was... He heard Jesus talk like this, and he saw, he, he saw how Jesus loved people. And the Apostle Peter was, was a, gosh, man. He was a man's man. He was a fisherman. I'm sure he had a foul mouth before he got it, tried to clean it up. I mean, rough guy. He was impulsive. He had a tendency to act first, think second. But as he's listening to Jesus, he began to think, okay, okay, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm, I, I'm starting to get it. Okay, Jesus, here's what I'm thinking. I'm actually going to forgive somebody, but Jesus, I'm going to forgive them, I mean, seven times. And he was thinking, you know, that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm making progress. Seven times I'll forgive somebody, Jesus. And so he's feeling good until Jesus says what? Matthew 18 says this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No. Not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. So Jesus is about to tell another story. Jesus made up these stories. We call them parables. Or if you want to, call them made up stories to make a point. 
if you don't like the fancy name parable. And so he's going to make a point to Peter by making up this story. And here's what he said. Servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of the debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold. What? Yep, that's what he said. Along with his wife, his children, everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on a fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured. Tough story, huh? Until he paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Jesus had a way of telling these stories for a shock value to help people realize just how serious he was about this. How many people are in your life right now that think you haven't forgiven them? How many people may not know that you haven't forgiven them, but you know? God's pretty serious about this forgiveness thing, isn't he? Third thing, you forgive for its own reward. It's kind of surprising to most people. Most people think that if you go to heaven, it's probably because, well, you know, I talk to them. If 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 they're not familiar with the Bible, they'll think going to heaven has something to do with being good, getting your act together, hoping you do good enough to get in heaven. Actually has nothing to do with it. The Bible says that one sin will keep you out of heaven. Everybody needs forgiveness. Nobody gets in by what they do. But surprise, surprise. There are a lot of rewards mentioned about heaven. You say, wait a minute now, you get in by trusting Jesus for forgiveness. You admit that you sin, you ask him to forgive you, you trust him to forgive you, and you want him to be the leader of your life. To use biblical language, you're asking him to be your savior and Lord. But now you're saying there's rewards? Yeah, it has nothing to do with why why you go to heaven. But once you get there, it matters how you lived. The Bible is full of stuff where it talks about the way you live matters. It says you can't give out a cup of water in Jesus' name without your reward in heaven for it. Everything. That's that's very, very insignificant, isn't it? So everything about your life matters. When you serve, when you give, when you love, when you forgive, all these different things that you do matter, and they will show up. But you're to forgive for its own reward. What in the world does that mean? Luke chapter 6, verse 31 says this. Do to others as you'd like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? I mean, even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full reward, return. Instead, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love your enemies. I want you to do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and even wicked. If you've never read the New Testament, you're missing out. As you, as you start cruising through, I've been reading through Luke lately, 
As you cruise through Luke, you come upon this particular story where Jesus has been invited to the home of a Pharisee, which is a religious leader, which is a, who had a very strict policies about what they did. I mean, they were trying to get it right. They kind of went overboard with the rules. No, they went way overboard with the rules. And Jesus was invited to this guy's house. Well, th back then when you, when you went to someone's house to eat, the tables were low to the ground. They didn't have these dining room tables like we have with six chairs or eight chairs around them. They would lay sideways at the table and eat because it was down low to the ground. In the story, it says that while he was there, a woman from the city who had perhaps the worst reputation of any woman in that city came in to where they were eating that meal, and she was just weeping. She had, well, she had heard Jesus. She had been impacted by him, and she was just weeping. And her, she was crying so much, the tears from her face were falling on his feet, and she used her hair to dry his feet. And she just kept crying and kept wiping. Because the custom in that day was when someone came to your home, because the roads were dusty and you wore sandals, they'd offer water so you could get the dust off your feet. But in this particular case, in this particular story, it hadn't happened. And the, the religious leader said, man, I mean, he was thinking to himself, if this guy really was a prophet, he'd know about this woman. Jesus knew what he was thinking. And then he said this out loud in Luke, Chapter 7, he says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. If you have a sense in which, you know that illustration of 25,000 sins in a lifetime. If you have a sense in which you've done great wrong and you've been forgiven for all this, because see, when we ask Jesus to forgive us, we're not simply asking him to forgive us for the things we did in the past. We're asking him to forgive us for the things we'll do today. We're asking him to forgive us for everything we'll ever do, every sin for the entire lifetime. We're asking him to save us from the penalty of all of our sin, all 25,000 plus, and that's probably going to be us. Well, I hate to tell you this. I think you're going to bust that number. And so you, you're going to be forgiven a great amount, a great amount. You are forgiven a lot. And because if you realize that, you'll be so much more forgiving toward other people. If you don't really think you've been that bad, you might not, you, you might have a tendency to, oh gosh. Look down your nose, so to speak, at others. Find somebody who knows they've been forgiven of great amount. And you'll find somebody that's willing to extend grace to others, extend forgiveness to others. You want to shock the world? Be the person that loves your enemies. Be the person that prays for your enemies. Be the person that's known to be forgiving. That doesn't mean you don't address problems. That doesn't, you can have, you, you, that doesn't mean you ignore things. The last point, forgive those who don't deserve it. What I'm about to show you is tough. Luke 17. If another believer sins, it says rebuke that person. In other words, at some point you go privately, the Bible says in other places, you go privately to the other person and say, hey, what you did was wrong. I want, I'm here to help you. I'm here to say that what you did was wrong. But I'm also here to say, I want, I want to help you. I want to, any, anything I did wrong, I want to come clean on. I, I, I want to help you head in the right direction. It doesn't mean that you go, you don't go talking to other people, you go talking to the person. You don't tell everybody else, you go tell the person. You go to them and you try to say, hey, what, you're heading in the wrong direction. And if that person is repentant, in other words, they say, ah, I was wrong, I'm sorry, forgive. Now, wait a minute, hey, wait a minute. 
Are you thinking ahead? How fast is your mind racing right now? I thought we were supposed to just forgive. If there's repentance, forgive. How does this work? Wait a minute now, you're confusing me. I thought we just forgive, but wait a minute, if there's repentance, we forgive. This is in the context of reestablishing a broken relationship. If a person is toxic, let's say you're a woman. You've got a husband. He's beat the crud out of you. You don't stay there. You get out because God wants you to be safe. You don't put up with being beaten. As you move out of that situation, believe it or not, you can forgive them. It doesn't justify, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't excuse it, it's, it doesn't make it right. It may mean he still goes to jail, but you extend forgiveness toward the person while he's on the way to jail. But the way the relationships can be restored when someone does something wrong is there has to be repentance. If, there, if there's not repentance, you've forgiven, but the relationship isn't restored yet. That may take time. That may take you going to counseling. That may take legal things happening. That may take you, who knows what it's going to take. That's really a complicated thing based on what's going on in the situation. But, here, but the point is this. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day, and each time again and again ask for forgiveness, you must do what? Forgive. The apostles said to the Lord, when they heard that, oh, basically what they were going is going, oh man, no way. They didn't say it that way. Here's the way they said it. Lord, show us how to increase our faith because we don't think we can do that. And so when we talk about something like this, it gets really complicated. And that's, where, that's why at some point here, you might need to have professional counseling. You might need to have other believers involved in terms of giving you counsel about what to do, what not to do. But for a relationship to be restored, obviously there has to be repentance. You don't, when someone does wrong, that doesn't mean you ignore it, you don't excuse it, it's still wrong. But you can forgive a person that's even not repentant, but their relationship's not gonna be restored until they are. Let's sum it all up. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to each other, tender hearted, forgiving, just as God through Christ forgave you. I read this in my Google searches this week. Forgiveness is not what we do after the pain is gone, but rather it's the first step leading us away from the pain. Father, I, I pray that you'd help us to, to do what we can't naturally do, which is to be forgiving. Help us to come to a full realization of just how much we have already be, been forgiven by you if, if we've asked Jesus to forgive us and be the leader of our lives. Father, this is hard for us because our emotions have a tendency to take charge in, instead of our will. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to, to realize that the emotions will follow eventually, but we're simply to choose to do the right thing and that you'll reward us for it. You'll help us in it and you'll bring healing to our emotions and hopefully even healing to the relationship. And I pray, Father, for those that are far from Christ that are just trying to figure this all out. I pray that you'd help them to come to the realization that, that you love them so much you came for them to provide forgiveness for them and that if they turn to you and say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin, I don't get it all, but I get this much. You came for me to pay the penalty for my sin. I'm sorry. I'm asking you to forgive me and be the leader of my life. I pray you'd help them come to the point where they do that. They cross the line of faith and become a believer and begin to learn like the rest of us to be forgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
one of the hardest things you're ever going to do is to do the right thing in the face of your emotions. It's so easy to have your emotions be in charge, but we don't want our emotions to be in charge. We want to do the right thing and let our emotions catch up. Let's stand in praise. You deserve the glory. You deserve. You deserve. You deserve. 